All right, Revelation 21. Ah, there it is. Good. Revelation 21, verse 1. This is the end of the Bible. Always helps. If you want to get a good picture as to what the whole book is about, it always helps to read the beginning and the end. All right, so here's the end. This is what it says. Um, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea no longer is. The sea in ancient Jewish literature is a euphemism for unbelief. So essentially it's saying, uh, finally everybody's on the same page. There's no, there, nobody's sitting around arguing about who's right and who's wrong. This is, fi finally everybody's come together here. The sea no longer is. And, and I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven. So at the end of the Bible, who's going up to heaven? No one. <laughs> no one. I get so concerned with everybody. We just can't wait to get to heaven. We just can't wait. To, so, and the idea is we're going up. Oh, we can't wait to go up. And God's idea is he's coming down. And I'm scared that people are going to pass in the middle, you know. <laughs> and, uh, 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 let me be very clear about this, okay? I'm going to say this very slow because I want to be very clear. When Jesus talked about heaven, he talked about heaven as a present reality as well as a future reality. So let's say it this way. Heaven is true here and it is occupied with people. Heaven is true there and it is occupied with people. Hell, when Jesus talked about hell, Jesus only said the word hell 18 times. 15 of the 18 was talking about hell being a present reality today. Three of the 18 was about hell being a future reality later. Okay, so let's be clear about this. Heaven is true here and it is occupied. Heaven is true there and it is occupied. Hell is true here and it is most certainly occupied. Hell is true there and it is occupied as well. Right? So, but the primary emphasis of Jesus' teachings was not how to go to heaven someday. His teachings were primarily the emphasis was, hey, how can we take whatever's in heaven and bring it right here to the earth? The issue is, why would you wait to go to heaven when there is a clear opportunity to allow heaven to be established right here now, today, the end of the story is that heaven is coming down and God is going to be people's God and they will be his people and everyone's going to be on the same page. And we hold to that blessed hope. In Revelation 21, the picture you get is everything in heaven is coming to the earth. Here's my question. If that happened tomorrow, would you be okay? Do you, do you reckon you'd like heaven? Be very careful before you answer that. But before you answer that, at least go back and read everything Jesus said about heaven and ask yourself, would you enjoy it? Like, for instance, Jesus said that in heaven, all the secret conversations of your heart will be revealed for all to see. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> you want to go there? <laughs> so if right now you're thinking, what an idiot, it would be on a billboard over your head, see. <laughs> so if your lifestyle is dodgy and manipulative and secretive, you're going to find heaven very challenging. What if you're a racist? Or what if you know a racist? Because uh, there wouldn't be any racism in New Zealand, right? So, so what if you know a racist? And let's say this racist has two minutes to live and he's in the hospital. And, and so we send a white person to go lead him to the Lord, right? Because you can't send Sajan, for goodness sake. He's, the guy's a racist, right? So <laughs> this Sajan walks in. He's like, get out. You know, so we, we send Mike or myself or Ian. We're all the right color, you know. So, so we walk in there and we say, look, you got two minutes to live, mate. Seriously, I, I urge you, please, I urge you to sort things out with Jesus right now. And the racist goes, I think, I think you're right. Will you please help me? Please help me. And this guy with all sincerity prays some sort of prayer that says something like, Lord Jesus, I have, I have stuffed my life up. Please be the Lord of my life for the rest of it. All 20 seconds, right? <laughs> And so he looks at you, and he's never been to church. He doesn't know anything about the Bible. He doesn't know anything. He says, I've only got 20 seconds to live. Why? What does that even matter? Why did I do that? And you've got one sentence. You can't open your Bible. He's dying in 10 seconds. You've got one sentence. So you say, um, uh, uh, you did that because when you die here in a few seconds, you're going to wake up in heaven instead of hell. The guy goes, that is fantastic. This is the most energetic dying person you've ever met. But I'm on a stage, so you have to do it up a little, right? So he says, he says, that is fantastic. I'm so glad about that. Four seconds later, he dies. Where does he wake up? Heaven, right? I'm not trying to trick you. I, I, <laughs> people are like, I don't know. I, I don't know. 
Where does the guy wake up? Heaven. So this racist wakes up at a table with every tribe, tongue, and race. Is he in heaven or hell? <laughs> to the racist, heaven is hell. The question isn't so much, will you go to heaven when you die? What if a better question is, if heaven invaded your life tomorrow, what parts of you would survive and what parts of you would be burned up? Why, why would you wait if Christianity ever became a group of people who were waiting to go to heaven one day? They would be horrible, elitist, societal, tribal people who thought they were better than everybody else. Aren't you glad we escaped that? <laughs> Christianity was never called to be a group of people who got as many people as possible into heaven. They were called to be a group of people who partnered with God to establish the kingdom right here on the earth. None, none of Jesus' followers ever took him that way. You never see Jesus showing up and people going, Oh, great, you're here. We get to go to heaven now. No. Jesus died and rose from the dead. You got to admit that's pretty impressive considering he called his shot, right? He dies, rises from the dead. He comes back from the dead. And how much does he talk about heaven? None. How much does he talk about hell? None. I find that amazing. What I find more amazing is that no one asked him. If I died today and you came to my funeral on Wednesday and then I showed up here next Sunday and ruined your service. <laughs> and they gave me a mic and they said, Sh Shane is back from the dead. We, we, we need to ask questions. H how many questions will we get through before someone said, hey, what's that, what actually happens? Of course, it would be like the first question, right? But no one asked him. No one asked him, Jesus, you're back from the dead. That's amazing. What was heaven like? What was hell like? I heard you preach there. How was your altar call? <laughs> did, did you clean out heaven, you rascal, you? You know, when you rose from the dead, it says tombs everywhere emptied. Was that your altar call? Jesus, you funny guy. Are you going to write a book called Three Days in Hell and make a billion dollars because people are scared of it? That would be amazing. <laughs> No one even asked him. Jesus comes back from the dead and here's his followers' response. Oh, great, you're back. Are we going to take over Rome now? Why would, they, why would they think that? Why would they think? Because that was his message all along, that we are going to establish the kingdom right here on the earth. And in their mind, to establish the kingdom on the earth, we got to take over Rome. They were misguided because that wasn't God's goal. God's goal was to establish his kingdom through a body of Christ, not through taking up of arms, but through a body of Christ who would duplicate God throughout the world by establishing heaven right here, never to be a group of people waiting to go to heaven someday. Although we hold to the hope that heaven is true someday, and it absolutely is, that is not the main goal of Christianity. Your goal is not to get to heaven someday. Your goal is to reach into heaven and bring everything in heaven right down here. That's what it means to be a disciple. It means to be a, to be a disciple of Jesus means to be actively participating in establishing heaven on the earth. So I went through, and I looked at everything Jesus said about heaven, and I found it so challenging. Let, let, let's, sort of, let's sort of talk through some of these things. When we think of images of judgment, which by the way, the word judgment in, 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 in the word translated judgment in the New Testament is the word colossus, which means to prune an apple tree. It, 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 there's apple farmers here. I, I hope I'm right on this. They, they could tell you that, um, that halfway through season, there's a lot of little apples, and so you have to go around, and you've got to knock off a lot of the little apples so that the nutrients of the tree will go to the big, it makes big apples. That's, it's, it's, it's that. It's cutting excess off. It's cutting what's not going to bear fruit off so that things that do bear fruit have the nutrients to do it. Okay? So, so, so the word judgment in the Bible is not... A, a, a guy wearing a black robe with a white wig and a hammer, it, it's, it's more a farmer with pruning shears. Think about how Jesus talked about judgment. He said, I'm the vine dresser, you're the vine. Whatever parts of you are not bearing good fruit, I'm going to cut it off because, because it's not helping you. It's, it's, it's called pruning. So when Jesus said things like, judge yourself here so you will not be judged there. It, essentially, it's pruning. It's pr whatever's on your life that can't exist in God's kingdom, go ahead and get it off of you now. Why would you wait? Don't do that. It's ruining your life. He said it this way in one place. He said, it's better to throw yourself on a stone than to have a stone hurled upon you. Which essentially is a first century parental euphemism. It just means this. Boy, you sort this out or I'm going to sort this out. And you would much rather sort this out yourself. It's that. So here's my question. 
If you walked into heaven tomorrow, what parts of you would survive and what parts of you would be burned up? That is a better question. The, the problem with having hell, fire, brimstone being our judgment, being our issues in judgment, is that those words tend to always in our mind be about other people. When we talk about hell, we talk about them then. And, and that's only three of Jesus' mentions of hell. 15 of the 18 mentions of hell was about us now. It's about what are you bringing to the earth? How's your lust problem? How's your anger problem? Do you call people fools? How's your fear of man instead of fear of God? It's, it's not so much about them then. It's more much about us today. What are you bringing to the earth now? Now. And the problem with that is, is that there, there's, in, in the Bible, there are six mentions of fire and hell. Six. Six times it talks about fire and hell. There are 229 mentions of fire in heaven. Six mentions of fire in hell, 229 mentions of fire in heaven. Yeah. How many sermons in your life have you ever heard on fire in hell? Lots. How many have you heard on fire in heaven? None. How did that happen? 229 mentions of fire in heaven, six mentions of fire in hell. So actually, if your goal in eternity is to avoid fire, <laughs> hell might be your better choice. <laughs> Hell will let you stay a racist. Heaven will not. Heaven will not. Lots of fire in, in, in heaven. Now, I, because we're Westerners, I have to say this, because white people tend to think, take things very literally. And so God is not setting people on fire. As a matter of fact, there's several commands in the Bible where he commands people never to set people on fire. So it's like a pretty good idea, right? God is against setting people on fire, all right? And I know that comes as like a shock, but it's all over Leviticus, Deuteronomy. It's all over the prophets that you should not set people on fire, right? It's a pretty good idea. These are metaphors. The, the word translated fire is pure. All forms of the word purity come from that word. They translate it fire because in their words, in their world, they used fire to purify things. And so one rabbi said it this way, that the fire of heaven is God's relentless pursuit to make you the best you can be in his kingdom without taking your free will away. That God is relentlessly going to purify us. That is the deal. Now, let's, keep, let's look at some questions then. Here's the question I want to ask ourselves today. If, if the kingdom of heaven invaded your life today, what part of you would survive and what parts of you would be burned up? In other words, be brave enough to take note inside, is there anything on my life that could not exist if heaven happened today? And whatever that is, go ahead and get it off your life. Why would you wait? It's hurting you. Why would you do that? Let's ask let's another way. If you walked into heaven today, would you recognize it as heaven or would you think it was hell? Is there any part of Jesus' descriptions of heaven that you go, ah, oh, I hope not? <laughs> Number three, are, are Jesus' descriptions of heaven congruent with your life? Where would your life struggle to live in that environment today? Four, what pruning needs to take place in our life now so that the kingdom can be established in you today? Today, why would you wait? Now, let me just quickly read a couple scriptures to you that sort of exacerbate this, all right? 1 Corinthians 3.11 says this, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw. I love that. In other words, if your foundation is Jesus, whether you're rich, whether you're poor, it's all the same foundation. That is great. Their work will be shown for what it is because that day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of each person's work. Now, is this talking about fire in hell or fire in heaven? It's fire in heaven, obviously. If, if what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss and yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames of heaven. The idea is, is it's an invitation from God to do stock take of our life and say, if I walked into heaven tomorrow, what parts of me could thrive in God's kingdom and what parts of me would have to be burned off? It's the flames of heaven. How about this one? But who can stand the day of his coming? Who could stand when he appears? For he will be like a refiner's fire or a launderer's soap. Once again, a metaphor. A, a fire and a soap are not the same thing unless you're using it metaphorically. This is a cleaning agent. He will sit as the refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the Levites and refine them with gold. Hang on. How do you, how do you purify silver and gold? You, you heat it up. How about this one? For the Lord your God is a consuming fire. A jealous God. How about Jeremiah 23, 29? Is not my word like fire? 
like obviously a metaphor. Have you ever picked up your Bible and went, ow, that's hot? No, no, come on, come on, it's a metaphor. It's saying that the word of God has a purifying agent in it. If when you submit yourself to it, it purifies you. And like a hammer that breaks a rock into pieces. In other words, there's something about the word of God that breaks us up so we can be put back together more whole, more complete. These are metaphors. Jeremiah also talks later about, about God finishing his people like a potter does a clay pot. How do you finish a clay pot? You heat it up. You heat it up. Oh, there it is there. Um, Jeremiah 18 says, the word of the Lord came to me. He said, can I not do with you, Israel, as the potter does? Like clay in the hands of potter, so are you in my hands. Once again, a metaphor. Here's another one, Isaiah 42. So he poured out on them his burning anger, the violence of war. It enveloped them in flames, yet they didn't understand it. Obviously a metaphor. If you set someone on fire, your, your concern is hardly, do they get what you're saying? It's purification. In other words, they didn't understand that God was trying to purify them. It's the flames of heaven. Now, as I was looking through all Jesus said about heaven and being so challenged, this is one of the most challenging things I saw, and that is this. All, when Jesus talked about heaven, everything that's buried will be unearthed. Now, I want to unpackage this with you and leave you with a big challenge. Revelation twenty two twelve. And behold, I'm coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to each according as his work is. Revelation 22, that's the end of the Bible. Now, let's go back to Matthew 25. Jesus is talking about heaven. He's closing out his ministry, and he's leading up to this incredible sermon about sheep and goats and right and left and people who are in and people who are out. And he defines it all by being defined as generosity. But this is, how, this is part of the lead up to that. Um, he's talking about heaven. It says this, For it is as if a man was going abroad and his servants and gave them his goods. And to one he gave five talents and to another two and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And he went out abroad at once. And going he would receive the five talents, traded with them, and they made another five talents. And likewise he would receive two, also gained another two. But he would receive the one talent, went and dug in the earth and buried it and hid his Lord's silver. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and took account with them. And he went on and, and he, who had received the five talents had come and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, you've delivered us five talents to me. Behold, I've gained another five above them. And he said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler now over many things. Enter the joy of the Lord. So in this passage, he's talking about how your faithfulness with what you've been given on the earth determines your role there. It's not that everybody doesn't get the same wage, because later he said, or earlier he said that in heaven, whether you started work at 6 a.m. or at 5 p.m., you get the same wage. There's a big difference between wage and reward. It, that in the beginning of the Bible, it was in a garden, and even in perfection, Adam had work to do, a job to do. At Bible, it centers around a tree, and, and, it, and it's in perfection, and we will have work to do. I can't stand these images of heaven that were actually invented in the late 1700s of, of all of us wearing white robes, sitting on clouds, playing harps, and singing in perfect pitch to 1780s hymns. That sounds like hell to me, right? <clears throat> when I was a kid, I asked my pastor, pastor, what's heaven going to be like? And he said, Shane, heaven is like an eternal church service. And I thought, flip, that is horrible. <clears throat> Who would want that? How terrible is that? Of course, people have the same image of heaven today. They picture singing Jesus culture in heaven. And of course, if we got in a time machine and went back to 1780 and said, look, this is actually the rock music we're going to be singing in heaven, those people would be like, oh, no. Like, no, this is, this is about God establishing something in our role in it. So essentially, Jesus is saying, how you're living here is just going to continue. If you're faithful here, you're, you're going to be faithful there. If you're not faithful here, chances are you're not automatically going to be faithful there. And so there's this, there's this correlation that's going on. Let, let's keep going. Um, and he who had got the two talents did the same. And he said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. Now I'll make you rule over many things. Enter through the joy of the Lord. And he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that you were a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter. And so I, I was afraid, and I went and hid your talent in the earth, and now you have it back. 
And his Lord answered him and said to him, you evil and slothful servant, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gathered where I didn't scatter. Then you should have at least put my money to the exchangers and coming I would have received my own with interest. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to him who has 10 talents. For to everyone who has, more shall be given and he will abound. But from him who has not, even that which he has will be taken away from him. Now, that is Jesus' teaching on heaven. It's one of them. Are you okay with that? What if that happened tomorrow? Does that even sound like Jesus? To take from people who do not have and give it to people who have more? <laughs> Sounds like the exact opposite of what he spent his whole life giving himself to. Why? Because it's a metaphor. This isn't talking about money. This is talking about that in heaven, account will be taken for what you did with what you were given. And if you were faithful with what you've been given, then you'll be trusted with more things. But if you were not faithful, then what you were not faithful with will be given to someone else. Let me explain it this way. On the surface, it's just saying this, God's a good businessman. If, I, if I'm a contractor, you're a subcontractor, and I give you eight jobs. So today I give you eight jobs. And at the end of the day, I say, hey, how'd the eight jobs go? And you say, well, I got to six. I didn't get to two. All right. So tomorrow I give you eight jobs, and at the end of the day, you get to six, you don't get to two. What if I give you eight jobs on the third day, and you get to six, and you don't get to two? And then on the fourth day, I give you eight jobs, you get to six, you don't get to two. What if I, on the fifth day, I give you eight jobs, you do six, you don't get to two? How long is it going to take me to start giving you six jobs, and then taking the two you're not getting to, and give it to someone who actually has the capacity to do it? Jesus says heaven's like that. That God's going to establish his kingdom whether you like it or not. And if you're not going to participate in it, then what the grace he gave you to accomplish, he's just going to give it to someone who will accomplish it because God's kingdom's going to be established. Now, with that, let's make a couple of observations. One, the one who buried his talent had a skewed view of the master. The view that God is a hard and vengeful God only holds us back. Who really wants to work for a crazy maniac? who you don't know whether you're coming or going, you don't know if he's unlike you today or yesterday, who really wants to do that? It only holds you back. So many people don't try anything with God because they're so afraid of God that they're scared of giving it a go. That is dreadful. That is dreadful. The question is this, are we using what God gave us to bring heaven to earth or are we burying our talent? Are we using what God gave us to bring heaven to earth or are we burying our talent? Maybe we could say it this way. If heaven invaded your life today, you would find out if you used what God gave you for the common good or if you buried it. What have you done with your talent? Have any of you ever been at work and one of your coworkers says, how could your God be real with all the suffering in the world? Anybody ever heard, ever heard that argument? Like, how could your God be real? There's all this suffering. Is your God not powerful enough to do something? Your God's a failure. Even if your God is God, he's a failure. Have anybody ever heard that? And, you, and you're sort of a you're sort of like, you're sort of like, man, don't talk about my God like that, right? Like you're all just jacked up, right? But, but, then, but then you walk away and you're like, well, man, that makes sense. Actually, um, got a point. Um, have you ever, you ever thought like that? You, you, you want an answer to that? Okay, here's the answer. The answer is actually not in the Bible. The answer is in Forbes magazine. <laughs> I mean, let me explain. Um, in October, Forbes magazine, every October, they put out a celebration of the 400 richest people in the world. It's called the Forbes 400, okay? In October, Forbes magazine came out with their 400 richest people in the world, okay? The 400 richest people in the world combined have $1.27 trillion. 400 people have $1.27 trillion dollars. Roughly the amount of people in this room right now have $1.27 trillion. Let me tell you how much money that is. That's enough money to put clean water and sewer in the whole world. That's enough money to vaccinate the whole world against disease. That's enough money to set up perpetual education for the whole world and enough money to start the perpetual production of food to end world hunger and still leave them all billionaires. And God's the failure? Really? Or it's enough money to run the U.S. government for five days. (laughs) 
I can't believe how much people trust their government to take care of them. It never works. Even with Joseph. Joseph was a righteous man, and when he tried to set up the government to take care of the Egyptians, by Genesis 47 it says that he reduced the entirety of Egypt to slavery. Because he took their grain and stored it up, and then instead of giving it back, he sold it back. It has a price. Your health care is free. I'm telling you. Every, I don't know about your government. Everything the U.S. government touched goes broke. They took over the post office. It's broke. They took over Amtrak, which is our train system. It's broke. They took over the Mustang Ranch. The Mustang Ranch was a brothel on I-40 in New Mexico, halfway between Dallas and L.A. that was meant to provide prostitutes and liquor for truck drivers in the desert. They got done in for tax evasion. And the government looked at it and said, they're making millions. We're not going to shut it down. We're going to take it over to provide revenue for the government. They took over the Mustang Ranch, and it went broke. When you can't give away prostitutes and liquor to truck drivers in the desert, your business plan sucks. <laughs> and God's the failure? Let, let, me ask you, let me ask you this. Has God withheld the resources necessary to fix the world? It's within the power of 400 people to put a huge dent in it. A huge dent. You mean to tell me there's not a lot of government waste in New Zealand? Really? And God's the failure? No, someone buried something. That's the problem. And when I tell you, when I tell you stories like that, if I say there's 400 people that have $1.27 trillion, what is your immediate gut response? It's like, flip, they should do something, right? Are you right? Yes. Are you wrong? Yes, it's none of your business what they do. Here's my question. If 400 people could accomplish that, what could the top 400,000 do? What could the top 4 million do? What could the top 400 million do? If you drove a car here today, I don't care what kind of car it is, you're in the richest 700 million people in the world. What are you doing about it? What would happen if all of these people pulled their resources and said, we are going to unbury our talent and use it for something. God is calling us to establish heaven on the earth, and part of doing that is being willing to unbury our talent. According to the World Health Organization, 16,900 children are going to die today of starvation. Today. They're going to die today. And there's another 16,900 that are starting to feel the final hunger pangs of fixing to die tomorrow. And that's true the next day, and the next, and the next. 16,900 children are going to die today. What does your refrigerator look like? Could you not feed one? Considering the New Zealand dollar is very powerful over the Chinese won or the, or, or, or the, or the South African rand or... Do you know what one New Zealand dollar can do when you send it overseas? Somebody buried something. And I think that someone is us. Why, why couldn't, just because of this room, why couldn't that figure be 16,500 children by next year? I mean, there, there's, I don't know, you count everybody in the building, it's probably 400, 500 people here. Why, why can't we feed one apiece? What are we doing? Somebody buried something. I was down in a, a place called Gore right? Gore. What a great name for a town. Where do you live? I live in Gore. <laughs> and from my understanding, you guys live here, but from my understanding, Gore is the richest city in New Zealand per capita. So, so, so that per capita, they're the richest people in the whole place. The problem is, is the town next door to Gore, which I can't think of, is the poorest. So in New Zealand, you have this situation where the richest people are living next door to the poorest people. And there is a friend of mine down there who has become one of my heroes. Her name's Pam Heistead, and she, she looked at one of my teachings, and she got moved in her heart, and she said, you know, this is not okay. So she started an after-school program for underprivileged children in the town next door. And she said, please, you were, the, you were the inspiration for this. Would you come and speak to these kids? Which I'm horrible at speaking to kids. I don't even know what to say. I look at them and I like tell them Hebrew words. I don't know what to do. So, so, so I said, yes, but I'll do it, right? Now let me paint the picture for you. It was in July. Thanks. It was in July and it was one degree and it was blowing rain sideways. And so I don't even know where to go. So I'm looking 
I'm, I'm looking for the room, and it's blowing rain, and it's freezing, and this seven-year-old comes running by with no shoes on. And so I said, I'm going to follow him, right? Because he obviously knew where the room was, so I sort of followed him. But then once we got in the room, I figured someone needed to be an adult, and I said, hey, look, buddy, it's freezing outside, and you, you need to put your shoes on. We don't want you to get sick. And he went, shoes? Who has shoes? And I thought to myself, does he not have any shoes? So I asked Pam, I said, does he not have shoes because they choose not to wear them? Or can his family really not afford shoes? She said, likely his family can't afford shoes. And it was at that moment, she said, look around the room. And I looked around at this room full of kids and only half of them even had shoes on their feet. And I thought, we're in New Zealand. Flip. Somebody buried something. Somebody buried something. They absolutely did. Every year, God's not the failure, by the way. We are. God has entrusted all of us with a certain amount of talent. What are you using that God gave you, or what have you buried? Every year, we hear stories of people freezing to death, homeless people. There's a homeless shelter in my hometown that I went down there to see them because they feed a lot of people. And I said, hey, how can I help? I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll go around to restaurants, and, um, and I'll try to get them to donate more food. The guy went, no, 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 we don't need more food. And I thought, dude, you're a homeless shelter. You're feeding people. You need more food. He said, no, 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 we have more than enough food that come in every day because food will spoil. Like, we have more than enough food that comes in every day. What we need is more hands to feed the people. Our limitation isn't food. Our limitation is hands to feed it. So I said, so you mean to tell me that you have more than enough food. Your problem is you don't know have enough people to serve the food to the people coming in. He said, yes, that's right. And I thought to myself, when you're serving lunch in the middle of the week, you mean to tell me there's not 12 people watching the end of the Price is Right, waiting for the young and the restless to start? Are you kidding me? Somebody buried something. You mean to tell me there's not 12 people choosing to watch TV instead of feed someone who can't eat? Come on. Somebody has buried something. God is not the failure. We are the failure. You know what the leading cause of blindness in the world is? Dirty water. Kids drink the dirty water. Their gut adjusts to the parasite, but the parasite in the dirty water causes cataracts over their eyes, and they're blind by four. By the way, there's a guy in Australia... He's an eye surgeon. He said, this is not okay. This is just not okay. And so he decided to give the rest of his life to restoring sight to blinded kids. Do you know what it costs to restore sight to a blinded kid? $30. $30. Bucks. Do, you know what it cost? Do you know what it costs to have cataract surgery in America? $15,000. Somebody's burying something. Somebody's getting rich and profiteering on people's health. And that is not okay. $30 will restore sight to a blind kid. Let me ask you this. What's the last thing you spent $30 on? And how does it compare to the sight of a blind kid? Somebody buried something. See, when we, when we hear stories of burying, there's something inside of us. If you're not moved right now, I'm questioning whether you have a soul. 16,900 children are going to die today. If you have the ability to walk out and go, what are we eating for lunch? What is wrong with us? I mean, go enjoy your lunch, but not at the expense of not helping someone else. That is not what we're called to be. We're called to be salt and light and establish the kingdom of heaven on the earth. And when we hear stories of people who unbury their talent, it moves us. I, one of my heroes is a girl named Kyla Alexander. Kyla is 39 years old, and she's given up her dream of being married and have a family because she chose. She went to China. And in China, they have a one-child policy, and so that leaves a lot of problems when, when a child is born mentally handicapped. And so she went to the government welfare office, and it wasn't, these were not bad people at all. They were, not, they were just understaffed. And you had two people looking after 40 mentally handicapped children, and so they just couldn't do it. And so for their own safety, there was children, you know, shackled to, like, they had to, they had to leash them to make sure they didn't run off. And it wasn't that they were being mean, they just could not possibly keep up. And Kyla said, this is not okay. And she's given her life to restoring dignity to mentally handicapped children in China. I was just there. You ready to get mad? Ready to get mad? Here we go. I'm gonna make you mad. <laughs> this made me mad. I, I was just there. And um, I said, 
Kyla, what can I do for you? Anything within my power to do, I'm going to do it. And she said, well, we've recently had to cut everything back because we lost our biggest supporter. And I said, what? She said, yeah, there was this church. They were our biggest supporter and they cut us off. And I went, oh, I'm sorry. You know, economic downturn, churches go through hard times. They have to make tough decisions. I'm sorry that happened. She said, no, that's not the reason. That, that, that wasn't the reason at all, actually. She said, they sent a missions team here and I told them that, um, that they could not force the children to say the sinner's prayer because we were in communist China. And, um, and so they, when they left, they cut our support off because they said, what good is what you're doing anyway if all of them are going to burn in hell? So that's our story. God's torturing mentally handicapped children now. We're sticking by that. I said, what's his name? What? What's the pastor's name? I haven't opened up a can on somebody in a very long time. <laughs> I said, Kyla, that's not okay. And Shane Willard Ministries will do everything they can to, to make up the downfall that you just suffered. We are not going to let these children suffer because somebody else thinks that people are going to burn in hell because they're too mentally handicapped to say a specific prayer. He just summed up the whole problem with Christianity right there in one sentence. No, it's not okay. We're going to help those kids. You hear Kyla's story. You go, yes, go Kyla. Stick with it. Come on, girl. You're doing a great job, don't you? Something inside of you does that. There's a friend of mine in South Africa named Brandon Eckert. He's one of my heroes. Brandon was a 26 gang member. Um, bad dudes. And um, he got saved. He came to the Lord um, listening to my message, the authority of the rabbi. And now there's a revival in Polesmore Prison because he's been allowed to take the DVD of the authority of the rabbi in there and show it to him. That the head of the 26s wrote me a letter. The guy, the head guy of the 26s wrote me a letter to say that he'd given his heart to the ways of Jesus. It, it, was, it was really cool because he started out, Hi, Mr. Willard, my name is Bones. <laughs> It's like high bones. And, and so bones, bones, he said, I don't even know what it looks like to give my heart to Jesus as the head of a gang, but I'm willing to give it a go. He went and led his number two guy to the Lord. And so I got to meet him. His name was Colin. And so there's this thing going on in Polesmore Prison. And so Brandon gets out and Brandon says, this is not okay. This is, this is not okay. I'm going to do something to change the cycle of poverty in my city. So he started a ministry that gets drug addicts and prostitutes and gang members off the street. And what he does is, is he gets them high school educated. First, he gets them off drugs. Second, he gets them high school educated. Third, he gets them a job training so he can break the cycle of poverty. Last time I was in Cape Town, the district attorney of Cape Town asked to meet with me, which made me nervous. Why is the district attorney calling me to court, right? This is an odd feeling. So I, I go into court and this, this, this district attorney um, says to me, she says, I just want you to know, she said, because I know you're pouring in tens of thousands of dollars into this from America, and I want you to know that it is working. He is now recognized by the South African Department of Justice as a viable option to Polesmore Prison, so that if people commit crimes and we're going to send them to Polesmore Prison, instead of sending them to prison, they can have the option of going with him. And if they complete his program, it counts as their prison time. But if they do not, they go to prison. So far, 100% success rate. <clears throat> when you hear that, don't you go, yes, go Brandon. When people unbury their talent, it's so moving. All of us know the famous ones like Heidi Baker and taking care of orphans in Mozambique. And you, you look at these stories, these incredible stories, Mother Teresa, what she did for lepers. And it, this, this lady, uh, can't, uh, she's going to shave her head for lepers. If a woman's willing to shave her head for lepers, give her 10 bucks. Flip. There's several hundred of us here. Why couldn't she raise $3,000 for lepers today? What? She's shaving her head for lepers. What? what? And we're going to go, oh, well, good on you. I mean, what? No. Come on. Unbury. You mean you'll miss $10? Come on. No. We, we hear stories like this. And something in us goes, yes. And my question to you is, is why not you? 
What does your refrigerator look like? What could you do? Where have you, where have you sat on your laurels? And the truth is there's a lot of great people who don't do anything for anybody else, and it's not because they're not good people. It's because they don't intentionally set out to do it. You're not going to wake up in the morning and accidentally do this. You have to wake up in the morning with full intention to make someone else's life better. And here's my question. Whose life is better in the last 30 days because you were in it? And if you can't think of anybody, and right now, if you're a narcissist, you're thinking, well, my wife's life is better because I'm in it. No, it's not, what, it's not what I'm talking about. She would likely disagree with that. I'm talking about outside of your family, outside of your four walls, whose life is better because you're in it. All of us would know that Jesus honors this sort of behavior, but how many of us are actually doing it? And it's not because we're bad people. It's because we don't, we think it's going to happen accidentally. It will not happen accidentally. You have to, with intention and focus, unbury your talent. Bay City Outreach Center is one of the greatest churches I go to in the whole world, and I've traveled the lot of it. Okay? You have an incredible opportunity. But Bay City Outreach Center cannot keep on existing with people burying their talent. There's so much talent in this room that God has given given this place. God has entrusted this place to to be a part of the redemption process of the whole city. What are you doing sitting on the fence? What are your options? Well, I I can't miss NCIS. Are you kidding me? Get a DVR. Watch it without commercials later. It's better that way anyway. Plus, it comes out in America first. Let me ruin it for you. Gibbs gets the bad guy. He's amazing. A City Outreach Center is going through transition as an organization. Now, more than ever, it needs its people to stand up and unite and unbury their talent and say, let's go do what God has us to do in this city. Let's establish, may we never be people waiting to go to heaven someday, but may we be people determined to bring heaven to every place we see hell on this earth. Let's let's ask ourselves a few questions. The quality of what you're living for is only determined by what you're willing to die for. The quality of what you're living for is only determined by what you're willing to die for. Let, let, let's, let's ask it this way. What does your life revolve around? Temporary pleasure or God's redemptive will for all of creation? <laughs> but, let's, maybe, maybe this will be more telling. What's the last thing that made you angry enough to get your shovel out and unbury your talent? Or maybe a better question would be, what's the last thing that just made you angry, Period. You know what I find? Is that Kyla Alexander doesn't get angry over roadworks. I know, I know. They, they're still fixing the same road. I know. I've been coming here seven years. They're still fixing the same exact road. <laughs> Kingdoms have risen and fallen. Nigeria has changed, and pre- changed empires seven times. New Zealand is still fixing the same flipping road. <laughs> I know. I know, I know. It's so annoying. It's, so, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. You know, you know, what, you know what made me mad? I, w- I went to a grocery store the other day, and the cashier was really slow. Oh, man. What made you mad? You, you, you know, if I told Kyla that, Kyla would be like, so you have the luxury of living in a country where you can drive a motor vehicle to a store that prepackages food for you, and you still find a reason to be upset? Over the slowness of the cashier? Oh, I know. That must be so tough. What makes you angry? Shane, you don't understand. My husband left his underwear on the floor for the 17,000th time. I know. You know that guy that you would expect to die for you if an intruder came in? That guy? Yeah, must be tough. Must be tough living with someone who would die for you. I know. I know. But Shane, my wife falls asleep too early. I know. I know. That's annoying. Wake her up. Tap, tap, tap. What are you doing? What makes you angry? And how does that compare to what God's doing in the world? Sometimes we just need some perspective. What I find is that people with anger problems, they don't really have an anger problem. They have an energy problem. They're not giving enough of their energy away, so they have too much of it. What are you, the cure for anger is not prayer. The cure for anger is giving your life away to something so much that you don't have the energy to be angry about stupid stuff. How about this? What are you willing to do that for today? 
So you might be there and say, well, what could I do? What could I do? If you can't think of nothing to do, go to fredhollowsfoundation.com, just Google them, and give them 30 bucks, and at least give sight to one blind kid. By the way, I get no royalties from them. I just believe in them. You can, you can, on your way out today, you can purchase a set of CDs or a USB, and you can know that when my director of charity goes to China in a few months, that it's going to be given to, to mentally handicapped children in China. You could do something. You could call your pastor this week and go, hey, I've been sitting on the fence. I've been burying my talent. Where can I get involved in this place? What can I do to help you bring the kingdom of heaven to the earth right here in Hastings? What can I do? You could do that. But you have to set full intention of doing it. It's not going to happen by accident. I got a friend who left church. And I asked them, why did you leave church? And they said, well, we're just tired of the church being so selfish and self-centered. And I said, well, I get that, but leaving is not going to fix it. But they left. And you know what their life looks like today? (laughs) They get up in the morning. They eat breakfast together. They each go to their different jobs. They come home. They have some sort of afternoon tea. They eat supper. They watch two episodes of Modern Family, one episode of NCIS. They go to bed. Then they wake up the next day and they repeat it. What a life. So she left the church because it was selfish. But now her life has become what she hated in the first place. And is she a bad person? Absolutely not. She's one of the best people I know. But the truth of it is, is that when you don't intentionally set forth to be salt and light in this world, it will not happen by accident. Let's do it this way. In the kingdom, this is so important, it's not the summation of what I've done like addition. It's the measure of what I've done based on what I was given. How's your ratio look? How's your ratio? Your reward in heaven is not determined on what you've done. It's determined on the ratio of what you've done versus what you've been giving. What's your ratio? What have you done with what you've been given? Let me put it this way. When heaven hits earth, it will reveal whether your life was built on something that matters or something that will be burned up. Do you have an intention sense now that your life is about something bigger? And if not, why not? Listen, no matter what decision you make today, God loves you the same. It's not about God loving you. It's not about being forgiven. If your goal is to be forgiven, just... I don't know, go ahead and die, whatever, you're forgiven. But if your goal is to live the fullest life and bring heaven to every place we see hell on this earth, then there is so much opportunity for us to unbury our talent. And I'm urging you not to be people who just sit on the fence and don't do anything at all. I'm urging you to be people who reach in your pockets, who look at your hands, who do something to unbury what God's given you in order to make this world a better place. And I'm asking you right now, to make a 30-day commitment to do that once a day. It might be something small. It might be a quick, encouraging email. It might be you go to Fred Hollows, give him 30 bucks. It might be buying something there. It might be finding an orphanage or you know of something. It might be helping this lady that's going to shave her head for leprosy. It might be something. But why not? Once a day. Just make, I'm not going to make it undoable. All I'm asking you for is a commitment for 30 straight days to do one thing a day to make someone else's life better outside of your family. Just one, just once a day for 30 days, once a day for 30 days. And I promise you, if you live 30 days like that, at the end of 30 days, you will not be able to imagine living any other way. So much good that can be done. You will find it will help your worry problem. You will find it will help your anger problem. You will find it will help your anxiety. It will help your grief. It will help the pain of whatever you've been through in the past. When you give your life to something else, it solves all those other things. I'm urging you and I'm challenging you for the next 30 days. 30 days. Will you do something once a day for someone else outside your family? Just 30 days. After 30 days, ask yourself, do I want to do another 30? All I'm asking you for is 30 days. 30 days. Now, if you will do that, I want you to make a commitment before the Lord right now simply by bearing witness and raising your hand. I will do this for the next 30 days. Quick, quick, up, up. Up. Okay, now I want you to look around. Keep your hands up. Look around. I want everybody to know that you're, you're able to hold these. It just it, have fun with it. Don't be judgmental. Have fun. Just ask each other. Ask each other. Hey, hey, 
What did you do this week? Maybe somebody who knows what you can put your hands on. Maybe someone who knows what they're doing with Facebook, because I don't. Maybe you could start a Facebook blog um, on Bay City Outreach thing called, called Salt and Light or whatever you want to call it, and just have, have it there for people to put their stories. Hey, I was here, and this is what happened. You wouldn't believe what God did. Hey, I was here, and this is what happened. You wouldn't believe what I saw God do. And man, when, when we start telling stories like that, it creates energy. And I promise you, I promise you, this is what God has called Bay City to be. Regardless of who's standing up here, this is what Bay City is. A group of people bringing heaven to every place they see hell on this earth. I urge you to be that. Let's pray together. Lord, you're wonderful. We love you and we honor you. Lord, forgive me for the places I've buried my talent. I want to be someone who uses what you've given me to establish your kingdom here. If you, I'm going to pray a prayer with you. If you mean it, I'll tell you the prayer first and then we'll pray it together. If you mean it, I want you to get in on it. And this prayer goes like this. Lord Jesus, give me the courage to see things differently and the irresistible urge to respond to what I see. Me both. So if you mean that right now under your breath, not in a way that points you out, just under your breath, say, Lord Jesus, give me the courage to see things differently and the irresistible urge to respond to what I see. If you're here today and you've never received what Jesus did for you before the foundation of the world, you just, need to, you, you just want to get on board. You want to start your journey with God. You could say something like this. Lord Jesus, I have no hope of saving myself. So I ask you to be the Lord of my life. I choose to trust your version of my story instead of my own. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Would you look this way? Thanks so much for letting me be your guest all weekend. Always love coming back. Hope you're really blessed by that. Tonight, I'd like to invite you back. Um, I'm going um, to close out my whole series of thought tonight um, with something very, very special. So you won't want to miss that to stay home and watch TV. Just put it, just tape it, all right? The, or record it. Nobody tapes anything anymore. I know. It's just a habit. Just, just, just do that. Come, come on back. Um, it's been a pleasure being with you. I urge you to be salt and light in your world. Grace and peace be to you. God bless you.